This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. Please note that this podcast will have spoilers. In this chat, we will discuss the underlying themes, historical influences, inspirations, technology, ethical dilemmas, and other inspirational insights we have gleaned from each episode of the first season of Mr. Robot. We will be bringing on experts to share their insights and knowledge with us in each chat. We will also be reviewing each episode of the first season, as well as the second season when it premieres. We are awake, we are free, we are alive for F Society IRC Podcasts. Society RC podcast. This is your moderator, Rosa Shine, with another chat. In this chat, we are discussing Handshake, uh, the season two episode of Mr. Robot, which is episode seven. So, we're going to start off with the women, um, beginning with Joanne, you know, the little anchor bomb, and Darlene, which are tied together. And then we're going to talk about Elliot. We're going to talk about the kind of big reveal, not a reveal, uh, basically just a confirmation of a, a theory that a lot of people were showing and there was a lot of clues along the way that alluded to this theory so much similar to last season's reveal Mr. Robot him being you know kind of like a Tyler Durger type of a character uh, what was up in the air was and which was really a big twist was that Mr. Robot was Elliot's father there were some people that kind of sort of speculated that but that was super early on but for the most part nobody knew that I think right now a lot of people knew the reveal that happened that was in Elliot's storyline. I think what was unique about it was just the way the reveal was done as far as uh, the filming of it. How it was kind of like this drop away dreamscape type of a deal. The curtain was slowly being pulled and we're being revealed the truth of it all. So let's get into it. Uh, we're going to start with Joanne. Again, Joanne, um, <clears throat> her presence in the episodes. Um, I've been a bit of a question mark for the simple reason that, yes, she's Tyler, Tyrell Wallet's wife. She's a bit of a psychotic, but she's really been very disassociated from everybody else's storyline. She doesn't really intertwine other than being in the background, whether it be in the gossip magazines or referenced by the FBI and Don's storyline. But for the most part, in general, she is not something that is really tied to anything specific. And what she's doing or what she could be doing remains to be up in the air. Uh, We'll talk about that towards the end of the episode when we talk about Elliot's storyline, about the different theories that are floating out there. But for right now, what we open up with is a a flashback of of Joanne's storyline. And she has a gift on the table. It's a set of earrings. It's from uh, Tyrell Wellick, her husband. He's coming down the stairs. She puts them on. They go to a e-court party where they actually meet. The Knowles for the first time, in particular Shannon Knowles. And what's interesting about this was that the introduction, like Philip Price stated that Shannon Knowles is kind of like a silent partner. And I don't know if that is a hint or a clue or a revelation of the her connection to the company because she didn't work for E Corp. She worked for other companies. It was discussed last season. She was kind of like an independent type of a contractor, if you will, or maybe facilitator. But she seems to be very in tune or in dialed in at E Corp. And so it was like an all white party. There's Philip Price, there's uh, Tyler Well at Joanne, and they're, they're having a bit of a happy moment. And then it cuts away to Joanne walking her son. And then all of a sudden, this woman just kind of like a hippieish will, a hippieish, hippie-ish way, uh, throws a bucket of red paint on her. And this is the last scene, I believe, from any of the season two previews about what's going to happen for the season, like the little trailer for the show. This is the last scene that's been revealed to us. I believe everything else has been covered in previous episodes. So the the, the red face screaming, which Joanne does, she just screams, and this is very animalistic, almost painful scream. She getting red paint thrown at her and called a capitalist. Just freaks out. And of course, the Mr. Robot titles come up, and she's just, oh. The, the, the rage, if you will. And, you know, it then cuts into another more calm point where, you know, she, I guess you can say she's cleaned up and there's another gift on the table. And it's a picture of the sonogram of her son. And whether or not this is something that was sent to her or left on her front porch, we don't know. We don't know who's been sending these gifts to Duran at all, 
if it's even uh, tied well work at all. The last bit of Joanne's storyline is that her boyfriend, whose name is Derek, I think this is the first time his name has been mentioned, um, he's having his 30, 30th uh, birthday, he wants her to be there, he's told all his friends that she's going to be there, gives her an ultimatum that she needs to be there or they won't see each other. So of course, she doesn't show up. She meets him at inside his apartment. He's like, you know, we're done. None of your tricks are going to work with me. And Joanne said, you know, the reason why I didn't go is because I had to contact my lawyer who, you know, was not in this country. Um, I guess you could say that the Wellicks were not married in the States. Um, it's obvious that they're not uh, U.S. citizens um, per se. They could be naturalized citizens. They could be born here. They could have dual citizenship. But uh, she had to contact her lawyer who was not in the country. And she gave Derek a little kind of like almost a diploma as thing that indicates a divorce decree where she's divorcing uh, Tyler Wellick, and that is her gift for him for his birthday. And that's the end of her storyline. Like I said, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it towards the end when we talk about a little bit about the favorites. But on to Angela, Dom, and Darlene. Uh, when we left Angela, Dom, and Darlene, Dom had approached Angela and was like, hey, what are you doing upstairs? And Angela kind of froze for a second and they start conversating. And Dom was like, you know, I, I was just coming down asking you why you were there. And Dom states, you know, because she kind of has this very simpic way of speaking to people. Uh, she says, your, your story fascinates me. You know, one week before your company gets hacked, you land a job at E Corp. And you know, Angela was like, you know, oh, I was just up there to make plans, and she names the FBI douche guy that she was going to make plans for, and Dom's like, oh, what kind of plans? Well, lunch, and she goes, what do you say to lunch? She goes, well, lunch today at some Greek place, and Dom goes, well, how did you know, what's his face? And he goes, why are you here? Well, what is the purpose of this? And that's when Dom throws me, you know, kind of fascinated by, by Angela. And she also goes on, you know, where this is, it's not you. Uh, what's going on, it has to stop. But anyways, whatever this is, it's, it's, it's not you. Um, Darlene is in Andrew's ear, can I reassure her? She's just like fishing. She doesn't have anything. If you have anything, you know, you'd be owned right now. And, you know, Dom kind of leaves because Andrew's like, you know, basically kind of giving her the Dom the fuck off, get out of here type of a thing, if you will being polite about it, and Dom's like, you know, well, you know, we were going to question you anyways, so it's nice, kind of giving a nice introduction, and Angela's like, well, what about, well, you know, all stuff has happened, so Angela has that to look forward to, she has to look forward to being eventually questioned by the FBI, I wonder if she's going to get a lawyer, or the F society's going to prepare her for the type of questions she should expect, uh, but she finishes entering the code. Darlene gets on the phone, they get back on the phone, they get with it, and Darlene says that they own the FBI and everything's worked, uh, tells her, they, and basically, you know, F Society now owns the phones of the FBI, they have an insight of what's going on. Don being, you know, kind of the, kind of the high caliber FBI agent, the person that, kind of like Elliot, has a scratch in the back of her head and just goes and sorts it out, goes to the E Corp IT network. And finds out that the video for the FBI for is not existent. In fact, the entire video file for E Corp has been corrupted. Don tells them that they got hacked. Uh, she tells them to check Angela Moss's work computer, but there's nothing to be found. And leaves. So Angela is now, you know, kind of a bit of a suspect, if you will, on, or I should say, on Don's radar even more. I wonder what's going to happen when the femtel cell is found. Because it can only be one person. It's obvious that they're leaving. I don't know if F Society, once it's been activated and they have the phones in their system, if someone like someone in the cleaning crew is going to come by and pick up the femtel cell, or that's something that the Dark Army is going to do. But they, they did leave that behind. Um, I'm not sure how much the FBI, as far as the network cables and the motors and all that stuff, are going to pick up everything. And even if E Corp were to pick everything up, I'm sure that's going to stand out in some fashion. So we go on with Angela. She's in a cab. You can hear stuff in the background about the F9 hack. 
uh, is encouraging cops that they the New York transportation system is now accepting e-coin to pay for cab rides. They talk about the garbage pickup that we've been noticing in the last few episodes. It's been piling and piling up. Basically, what is happening is that business owners and homeowners are not capable of uh, paying for garbage pickup. So what's happening is these kind of peer-to-peer systems where people take dumpsters and do dumpster fires and people haul the trash to the dumpster at this little dumpster location. You can see it in the background. And the trash gets burned for maybe like, I don't know, 10 bucks or something for the whole whole lot. Uh, that's been happening. Uh, Angela, you know, gets out of the cab and she's going into her home. Darlene's there to, to meet her. Darlene was like, you didn't pick up your phone after everything has happened. And Angela's like, does not want anything to do do with her? They said, you know, I'm an open book. Darlene's like, I'm an open book. Any questions you have to ask? I know about the whole Cisco thing. And Angela was like, you know, when you were when we were kids, you and your brother used to think you're so much smarter than me. You know, I remember watching that stupid ass, silly ass, ridiculous, bad horror movie that she used to watch, make me watch every Halloween. I didn't put it together. Maybe I didn't want to put it together, but that's where that mask is from. And she knows that Darlene is basically trying to trying to run a game on her. Um, I think she sees through a lot of Darlene's social engineering stuff. She knows she's being played by Darlene. It might it might be just because they have such a strong uh, familiarity with one another. It might not be possible for Darlene so much to really truly social engineer uh, Angela uh, to trick her or do anything like that. But right now, it seems like Angela's been kind of waiting and dating and waiting for a moment, if you will, to strike to get back at stuff. It would be interesting to see what she's going to do with the Cisco knowledge, because she knows that Cisco's face is in the hands of the FBI, and that might not be something that currently F society knows about or that we'll find out about when they start owning those phones. So we're just going to continue on with Darlene. You know, Dom doesn't, I mean, not Darlene, but Angela Dom doesn't pop up again, really. Uh, Angela talks to her father. Uh, they're talking about settlement. Her father doesn't want to settle. He's like, he doesn't understand why she's with them. She's like, they found value. He thinks she's naive. She, he thinks he, he doesn't like her. He, he's disgusted by her, if you will. And he's not going to settle. And he, think, he says that she's not going to get anyone else to settle. And she's like, I got two-thirds. You know, he, he says, you need two-thirds of the class action suit to settle. She just already have two of the parts. I just came by here as a courtesy. And... You know, his, his dad throws it in. He's like, you're not going to get any money while you're doing this. And she and really, really emphasizes that they value each other. And they think I have some, something that I'm worth. And they kind of part ways. It seems like there there's a break, if you will, in the relationship. It seemed like the relationship was tense anyways. Um, but she passed away from her father. Uh, she ends up meeting with Philip Price. Uh, she told, informs him the contingency from the drop. He said, I didn't ask you to do that. She goes, I know. You didn't have to ask him to do it, but it's what you wanted. Uh, they have another kind of sit down. They're sitting next to like this kind of blue-esque like ocean landscape type of deal or breaking waves and stuff like that. It's actually pretty, pretty pretty. Uh, he said it was a good thing anyways that they're able to settle this. Uh, you know, even with the bailout, you know, the, the bailout situation, which I'm not sure if the bailout actually happened. It seems like the vote didn't occur, but he's saying that the um, E Corp is him making money. Settling was important. And Angela asked him, you know, why was it important for that contingency to be dropped? You know, what evil secret agenda are we protecting? He goes, aren't we all protecting some sort of secret agenda? And that's what Angela starts, you know, negotiating with him, saying that she wants to be in this management. He's like, that's like a lateral move. She goes, but that's where I want to be. She says, she starts again giving her pitch. That's when he says, you know, I have a birthday today. The real one is today. And he's kind of like coming on to her, which has been kind of hanging back whether or not there's any kind of real like sexual tension between the two or they're just playing like these weird mind games with one another. But Angela rebuffs him and he looks so hard for it. She gets the move. She goes to risk management. Uh, she's been assigned to a crisis response team. She's responsible for thinking outside the box, uh, eliminating access to basically losses that are going to happen. The biggest thing that is going to happen is uh, basically Flint water contamination, which is a real-world real world thing. 
Uh, expect the hit 2016 became a big deal in the fourth quarter. Nobody knows anything. He says, you know, here's a, you, you need access to the, the network. Who she asked for, so she can get caught up. So he talks, he, she's talking to the manager, the guy that's head of the department. He goes, you know, I knew getting Godfrey was one of the vendors. You know, I'm really sorry about, you know, kind of what happened. And she goes, well, I want to be on the daily debriefing that you guys have. And he's like, um, it's not really for management, it's for directors only. She goes, well, it'll enable me, allow me to get up to speed, and I can catch on real quick. No fuss, no muss. So he allows her, he allows her to attend the meeting. So Angela, you know, she ends up going to this meeting. Uh, it's her boss, this guy she's been talking to, and then like five other people in suits with like high level, high level, you know, corporate executives, kind of grumbling a bit, bit if you will, because uh, Susan Jacobs is supposed to be there. They're even not sure if they're supposed to have this meeting without her. Apparently, she took some vacation days. Um, they all have a laugh at a joke that you know the economy must be really tanking, and Susan Jacobs is taking vacation. Talk about the fact that Sue's not there yet. So her boss starts, you know, starts the meeting a little bit anyways, kind of in a ho hum way. He talks about how they need to mitigate um, their losses, and particularly with the current Trump crisis thing. There's a lot of lawsuits here. They start going through numbers. They're saying, you know, one of the guys is saying, I'm going to get a heavy hit here. The other guy says, you know, it's not going to be really bad there. A lot of it's going to be, again, pushed into 2016. And then that's when. Angela pipes in, and she's like at the far end of the table. And she goes, "Well, you know, I've been looking all over over this." And she goes, "If we pull the Dakota fracking settlement and the Washington Township shake settlement, and look at what those cases and how they were settled, we can use that as an example or a template to kind of mitigate our losses for all these other lawsuits." You know, if I just look at these files, I think I can find something there that we can utilize and we'll do that. And everybody at the, the, the table just kind of stares at her like. You're supposed to sit there and shut up. And they all look at the boss and he goes, You know what? There's nothing we can do here. He, Susan Jacobs is not even here. Food's not, you know, there's nothing we can do. And one of the guys pops up, What about the food? And he goes, The meeting's over. And so everyone leaves except for it's Angela and their boss. And so they're standing at one another and he goes, You know, you're only here because it's a favor to Philip Price. And he goes, I don't know what you did. Who you, Dick, you suck to get here. Who you slept with, but he's basically not having it. And she doesn't really say much. And he goes, you know what Philip Price told me? He says, I can do whatever I want with you. And I think this is the first time that Angela realizes that she's kind of boxed in a corner, boxed herself in a corner. I'm not certain how she's going to get out of this. I'm confident that she will because this guy's super overconfident and he thinks he's he's got Angela Pegg and he doesn't. But she, she's been in a bit of a corner, if you will, for the moment. And that pretty much ends the, the woman's storyline. I mean, it just pretty much carries out the end of the only... Uh, oh, wait, there's one more part. There's a key part. Really, actually, I totally forgot about it. Darlene, the last bit about Darlene. Darlene, after a meeting with Angela, she shows up at the F Society headquarters, and the three amigos are there at the computer, Mosby, Trenton, and Cisco. And they're staring super hard at the computer, and she's like, what the hell, what's up? What's up with that? And he like, can just say that it seems like something significant has happened there. And that's the end of not only her storyline, but the F Society there. Now we're going to get into Elliot. So Elliot's storyline is very significant. I think it's pretty much the conclusion. Well, we know it's the conclusion of where he's at, but also his battle with Mr. Robot. It pretty much picks up with the ending of the last episode, where it's him in the basement again, holding hands uh, with Mr. Robot. Um, and they start having a bit of a conversation. Mr. Robot is a bit angry because Elliot's asking, you know, you tried to hide Tyrell Wellick in that dreamscape. Why did you do that? And Mr. Robot said, you need to move past it. Past it. You, need to go, you need to stop going backwards. And he goes, you need to tell me the truth. So Mr. Robot is across from him. He slays down. He goes, what do you remember? And he goes, uh, the popcorn where Darlene held the gun. 
and he goes, okay. So it's basically us versus him. And Mr. Robot goes in how Tyra Wallace was talking about some cool shit about killing some women, uh, being gods. He felt that it was either going to be, you know, basically us or Tyra Wallace. And that's, yeah, they killed him. And Elliot is like, no, you didn't kill him. I did. I need to accept that now. Ray's henchmen come in. They take Elliot to Ray's office. Ray has him sit down in front of the computer. Ray's asking him if he's ready to go back to work. Elliot kind of, you know, mumbles, you know, yeah, he's ready to go back to work. Uh, Ray looks at his main henchman and asks him, do you think he's, does he mean it? The guy kind of doesn't give really much of an answer, but just goes around and sits at his chair. Ray goes, you know, how long is this going to take? And Elliot's like, says, like, a few hours. He's like, good. So Elliot gets to work. Mr. Robot's there, and he's like, you know, as soon as you get this done, they're going to kill us. And he goes, right now, we're safe because he Ray needs him for this site. So he gets the site going. He gets back up. Uh, the henchman's looking at the site, like, on his mobile device. Says that, you know, hey... We've made up, we're getting a lot of Bitcoin coming in. We've The time loss that we've had, we got $200,000. We've made up since, you know, basically Elliot fucked things up for them. And then Ray tells Elliot that uh, we're going to wait and see if this site purrs like a cat. Uh, we're going to sit you, sit you down in a safe place to make sure that's the case. So the henchman takes Elliot and is about to take him to... Another location, and that's when Elliot says, "What about a what about a game of chess?" So Ray and Elliot, you know, they start playing a game of chess. Ray says, "Okay for this," and they start talking to to each other like before before all this has happened. And Ray tells Elliot, you know, it was his wife that came up with the site that she was like Elliot. She was very smart, much smarter than Ray, and she was the one that you know had the expertise to come up with the site. This little website that just Kind of took over and took over life of his own, if you will. And he and his wife had an agreement that they were going to let the market dictate what was on the site. And it wasn't until Elliot looked, until Elliot came into Ray's life, that Ray actually looked under the site. And he said he was weak. He was weak to beat up Elliot. He was weak to beat up um, RT, what happened to RT. And that he should have took a stand. He also said that he thought he was going to be Ray. Ray was going to be Elliot's saver, but it turns out Elliot was his saver. And he starts, you know, doing a bit of a confessional, if you will, saying about the, the stuff, the advice that he gave Elliot before was, you know, completely wrong. And Elliot basically is winning this game of chess, and Ray knows it. You know, he's always known that Elliot's smarter than him, and he was going to win this game. But what ended up happening was that Ray goes to Elliot, you know, so how much... What time do I have? As he can see, to feed and knocks his king down. And Elliot looks at him and he goes, come on, man. We both know what was going to happen as soon as you got on that computer. And Elliot says, well, given the response time, that they're probably already have the buildings around it. And Ray was like, that makes sense. And he tells Elliot to go, and Elliot does. Elliot leaves the room. He goes out the door. He's out in the street, and SWAT, the FBI SWAT team is there to, to greet him. They go in to take in Ray and whoever, whoever else might be there the present time. Uh, basically, Elliot gives a little narration saying that he opened the site to ads. He emailed an anonymous tip to the FBI. Uh, he made it so that it was public to people could search it on the clear web, so it caused a lot of traffic, which was going to cause a lot of notice, and and obviously the FBI was going to take notice and combine that with the anonymous tip, they came with a raid. So the next time we see Elliot, he's uh, out there in the basketball court area with Leon, and he's it's been a few days. His face is still messed up. And Leon is going, you know, you got got people talking about Ray. He goes, you know, some people, half of them want, want to kill you for it. The other half want to praise you for what happened. The other half want to start sh stir shit up. And Leon's like, yeah, I didn't want any of this to happen. And then some guys come. And one of the guys is actually in his church group. And he comes and he goes, you know, he tells, tells Leon to leave. And Leon's like, I'm good here. And then he goes to Elliot, you need to tell your boy to leave. And he goes, ah. And he goes, and the guy goes, bravery is contagious. You need to talk to your boy. And Leon, Leon's not going to budge. So he tells Elliot that Elliot owes him 800 BTC, 800 Bitcoin. Uh, that was how much was in his wallet. 
and he, Elliot needs to pay him back. Basically, he owes him money, and he expects full payment. And then he and his goons kind of walk away. And basically, since Ares arrests, uh, it looks like things have gotten very tense for Elliot. Like, people are just looking at him. They're giving him a cross eye. He's basically got a, a, a bullseye on his back. Not only that, but since this takes place in July of 2015, um, at its peak... Uh, for that month, Bitcoin was worth three hundred ten dollars. Dropped down around two eighty for the month. So if we calculate eight hundred by the average, you know, split the difference, say around you know two seventy five. Elliot owes this guy anywhere from two hundred thousand to about a, a quarter, a quarter of a million dollars. So that's quite a lot of cash, if you will to come up with, and that's not something Elliot has. Or at least we don't know at the moment. Uh, the next time we see Elliot, he's in his church group. He talks to the woman, tells her that, you know, he's sorry for his emotional outbursts. It seems like some time has passed. Elliot's face is healed. And the woman embraces him, and of course, Elliot doesn't like being, being hugged. But she says, you know, I see you talking to him all the time. Um, you don't show it, but you're, you're obviously talking to him. And it's a good thing that you're talking to him. It's a good thing that what has happened. And so Elliot's in this church room by himself. And he kind of approaches to the Christ symbol. And he starts basically talking to Mr. Robot. And he's like, you know, I need your help. I, I don't know what to do because of Ray's arrest. And Mr. Robot's like, you, you always know what to do, Elliot. You know, I'm not here because, you know, I'm God. I'm here because... You know, we need one another, but I, I follow your lead. It was you that was, you know, I'm God, I'm here because, you know, we need one another, but I, I follow your lead. It was you that went S decided to have, you know, why did you listen to me um, when I left you that note? Because even though we kind of need each other, Elliot's a leader, and, he, and Elliot needs to lead. And this is something that Mr. Robot has been harping on. He needs to get back to leading the movement. And Elliot was like, I don't want to be a leader. I don't, you know, this is not what I want to do. And Mr. Robot was like, you know, those are the people I need you. I need to, I need to follow. Basically, I need, I need to, you know, get back to it. So this is what Elliot is struggling with, is that he, did, he doesn't want to be the leader of the movement. He doesn't want to be the leader of the cause. But he did start this. Um, he did start everything that was happening. And he's kind of embracing, if you will, his mission, his his purpose, if you will, be is to be the leader of society, this the leader of this revolution that Mr. Robot keeps talking about. So Elliot, you know, he embraces his leadership role. He burns up his book, you know, Red Wheelbarrow. Um, and he says, you know, he's going to get back to it, get back to the revolution, get back to the things that are happening. He's um, walking away from, I guess, the, the uh, basketball court, and that's when he gets jumped by the, the white king. By the king and the guys that wanted to break him. Um, the great union guy is basically telling him that he owes money and I'm going to not basically take his confidence out of you. And then Leon shows up. And Leon, you, all you hear is his because <laughs> Elliot's like pressed up against his fence. And all you hear is <laughs> and literally, not only does Leon like slit these guys' throats with this pretty massive knife. But I can swear that the guy that took his pants down and was about to rape Elliot, uh, he stabbed him either in the ass or in the balls or something. And Elliot turns around and he looks at Leon and Leon goes, um, you're going to get a letter tomorrow, Tuesday. Um, you're going to do what it says. And you're going to let Ro Ro Ray Rose know I did you a solid. And he says, yeah, I, you know, I believe in you, man. I'm always with you, cuz. And then he's, he has like these crap easy eyes about it, and he just kind of walks away. And then we see Elliot, and he's meeting with Krista. Um, it's the day after, if you will, or maybe Tuesday. Um, it seems, you know, probably in the month of August, if you will, because it's long after the 4th of July, kind of long after the events that happen. Elliot's face is all f fixed up. That takes a bit of time, takes some weeks. So I want to say we're probably in August now. And Chris to ask him, you know, about Mr. Robot, and Alex says, you know, we trust each other now. And 
house that you made, you were right. You should destroy a part of yourself just to ask him, um, you know, she kind of phrases it in the beginning of the letter and stuff, but she asked him, you know, oh, it seems you have a sense of love for my mom. I, I thought about, you know, just trying to get rid of him, but that's not what I need to do. I need to trust him and stuff. Chris asked him, where do you think you are right now? And Violet goes, what do you mean? And Chris is like, you know, you haven't been staying with your mother. And he goes, I am. And it sort of kind of fades away as uh, he turns a little bit to the, to the left, and so does Chris. And there's a red light that's been hanging in uh, on the wall of her office that's been there the whole time he's been having these sessions. And it kind of drips and fades away into like a, basically a, a prison visitation room. I like to say a prison guard, but Chris does, it has a, just a, a visitor's badge, and he's, he's in, the, in prison. So the prison theory is true. And she goes, I want to. When you get released, I want to maintain, you know, a regular schedule. And Elliot's like, you know, I am for that. And then Elliot starts talking to us. He, you know, he, as he's walking through and doing his daily routine, so Neon's there. He's, you know, going to eating and you see everything fade away to the commissary. Uh, the basketball court becomes like a basketball court prison system. He's in prison guard. Everybody's in prison guard. He's not walking on the streets of New York and where there's all these town empty kind of empty as townhouses. It's all these, you know, prison rooms. And he goes, I know, I know. I know what you're thinking as he's you know, he's taken to his cell, which is not which is not his room. Uh, the woman that tells him, you know, I'll see you in the morning is not his mom, is a prison guard. But he's like, you know, everything that's happened, it's it's true. Everything happened. But I needed to cope, so I hid things from him. I was so mad from last year when he told he didn't tell me about Mr. Robot. But I promise, if you shake on it, that I'm gonna tell you the truth from now on. And it's basically just how they walk through like Elliot's day, his routine, and like the resolvement of the illusion he kept so he can cope for being cope with being in prison, which is kind of mind bending. I mean, it's something that everyone expected, either their mental institution or prison. Uh, but now that it's been confirmed to prison, it was just it was just kind of mind blowing, if you will, in the sense of just the way they did it. Uh, it'd be interesting to see which theory is true about why Elliot is there. Uh, I guess we can talk about that. Is Elliot is there because of the dog napping and the, the hacking into Krista's boyfriend? If it has anything to do with uh, Shayla's death and the fact that he helped Veer break out of prison. Uh, it, it was just some kind of parole violation. Uh, maybe the knock on the door when the F9 hack occurred, the three days after, if you will. That knock is not something important. That knock might have actually been either um, the NYPD or the FBI. Uh, it would be interesting to see how that goes from there. Now that the prison theory has been confirmed, now that we know that Leon, that it was even a theory that Leon may have been attached to Dark Army because he did have a tactic a tat on his right hand. It'd be interesting to see what other theories and hints have been played out. How, why Dark, the Dark Army is protecting Elliot. Um, is it have to do with the fact that he is the head of F society? Does it have to do with the fact that he might hold the crypto the crypto keys? Uh, maybe he is actually part of Phase 2. We still don't know what Phase 2 is. We kind of know what Phase 2 is for F society, which is to kind of keep at Evil Corp and trying to destroy their image, trying to destroy any way or any means of them trying to climb back up out of the devastation that is the the hack, getting you know any information, all the you know dropping the the bulls ball and the uh, House representatives while they're uh, talking about the bailouts, uh, all the various protests that are happening that are kind of I want to say orchestrated but inspired by a society, uh, the ransomware stuff, the burning of the cash. It's kind of diminishing their their image, if you will. It would be interesting to see if there would be some kind of massive hack on the part of F-Society and a coin. That would totally break the confidence of that. Uh, that's something that's happened to Bitcoin. It has broken the confidence for a lot of people, particularly with the, the whole now Fox situation. But, again, these are things that are out in the open. It's nice to know that the prison theory is done. Uh, it's done being in this place. He and Mr. Robot have embraced one another. And then we can move forward and get involved and find out exactly what what is going on, what happened, 
I kind of know that Tyra Wellick is dead. I I put a question mark about that. I don't think that is the case. I think there's more that happened in those three days. I honestly don't believe that Tyra Wellick is dead because Tyra Wellick is the fall guy. If you look at all the background noise of the FBI and the news reports, they're all saying that they're looking for Tyra Wellick. Um, Bryce and White Rose at the end of the season finale of last year, when like, well, we know who did it. It has been, I guess, put out there by even e that Tyrell Wellick is responsible for the hack. So it, it doesn't behoove Elliot to kill the fall guy, if you will, because he can use Tyrell Wellick to protect that society as the fall guy, as the inside guy that was responsible for this hack. Particularly the fact that Tyrell Wellick doesn't know any of the other hackers. He only knows Elliot. And there might be a way for Elliot to wiggle out of that, but it would be very hard-pressed to of other members of the group who are also named by Tyrell Wellick for them to wiggle out, if you will. Again, um, the Washington Township plant played a prominent role. Obviously, it's very, very, very important. Whether or not it's tied into ecoin or if there's something about the nature of the plant itself, in the 90s s sitcom thing that happened last episode, um, the e the e plant, the Washington Township plant, showed showed a case as a, a nuclear power plant. Well, that could have been an ode to The Simpsons. It might have actually been what uh, the Wash the Washington Township plant was. Uh, I still think there's something there. I think maybe it has to do with e coin. It might have to do with, with the quantum computers. There's people putting out their AIs. Because there has to be a way besides, you know, the, the true faith and credit and reputation of evil court for that coin to have value. Um, even, even if the e-coin has been made to have more value than the U.S. dollar, just by the sheer willingness and with the fact that e- evil court has so many financial institutions and merchants and is kind of putting it out there for people to utilize and saying, hey, if you come to our stores, you get 10% off or 20% off or... 50% off if you use uh, e-coin. There has to be something more backing it up. There's a theory where we get into Joanne for a little bit. Whether or not Derek is being set up by Joanne because of the nature of their the sexual interplay to be sim- to be set up for the murder of Sarah, uh, Shannon Knowles. Um, they did meet at an e-court party. People are aware of them or know about Derek a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if that is a good through, but it might be something that's happening. Because as far as Joanne knows, I mean, yeah, Joanne knows, Tyra Wellick is only responsible for one crime. That is the murder of Susan Mills. He's not responsible for the F Society hack. So I think she's trying to clear her husband's name of the murder because it would be very apparent that he's not responsible for the hack. What other theories are going on here? Um, let me touch on Oh, is Cisco with F Society? Or he's or is he always dark army? Is he a double agent or not? Because with the whole C D thing and the film to sell, it it'd be interesting to see exactly how Cisco lands because right now there's a big question mark. There's always been a big question mark, but now we're getting kind of into dangerous territory because the film to sell obviously has a back door to where the dark army can listen in as well. And that's that's pretty much it. I'd like to thank everybody for listening and logging off for now. Thank you for joining us on this chat. You can find us on all podcast outlets such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, MixCloud, and any podcast catcher. You can reach us on Twitter at FSocietyIRC, our website at FSocietyIRC.xyz. You can email us at FSocietyIRC at ProtonMail.com. Our music attributes are under the Creative Commons license number three. The intro music is by Monk. The song is called The Planet Shakers, the Paragraph Remix. Our outro music is by Trevev Halbeka, and the song is Zeltikapa, as well as Kwana, and the song is Demons. You can support the show either via the QR code in the show notes by contributing with a Bitcoin or through PayPal, and there's a link in the show notes where you can PayPal me under Hiroja Shai. If you're very into uh, cryptocurrency, you can also tip me through a uh, chain chip at Hiroja or at one name at Hiroja. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to hearing from you. Logging off. This has been a Hiroja Shad Space Odyssey Network 
Production.